Hello and welcome to the Digital Forensics and Incident Response Lecture. My name is Dr. Owen Redwood, and this lecture is part of the Offensive Computer Security 2.0 Open Courseware, hosted by HackAllTheThings.com. This lecture is broken into two parts. The first part is new lecture material, and the second part is old video. The first part, we cover how to understand incidents, describe them, identifying incidents, and incident response. And so we'll cover indicators of compromise, as well as the phases of incident response, including preparation and planning, and how to build a solid incident response team. And part of that, we will talk about a list of extremely useful digital forensics and incident response tools that are used in professional settings. Part two will cover a demo of volatility. And so it'll go through analyzing a memory dump of an infected system with volatility, carving out processes, analyzing those processes with IDA, identifying indicators of compromise and some identifying some signatures, and then how to write YARA rules with the given signature so you can identify, you can streamline the identify, identification of that attack in the rest of your systems. An incident response to a security breach or attack in general. So this may be denial of service attack, it may be data leaks, it may be confidential information that's marked, it may be personal, personally identifiable information, intellectual property, it may be trade secrets, an incident may involve sabotage, data corruption, system damage, hardware damage, uh, it may be standard malware like CryptoLocker or other common uh, malware families that are being seen these days. An incident response is an organized approach to addressing and remediating the aftermath of a security breach or an attack. The goals are simply to limit the damage of the incident, to limit the recovery time, and to limit the costs incurred by the incident. The common challenges in the general case are going to be for an organization, its budgets, your resources, limited personnel because you're not going to have the best team in place when an attack happens people may be on vacation or they may be out of work otherwise bureaucracy and shareholders and stakeholders are also another common challenge in big organizations as well as small organizations and we will discuss that in a little bit to build a proper incident response team the following roles should be filled by one or more people. Incident coordinator. That is someone who keeps track of everything, addresses the expectations of the bosses, as well as the impacted individuals or groups, as well as the customers, and then understands the bureaucracy and understands the laws and regulations of your industry. So if it's medical industry, it's HIPAA and etc. So the coordinator keeps track of the whole incident response, but another person, or there's another role to fill, and that is the incident manager. It may be the same person as the coordinator if someone has sufficiently strong management skills, but this is someone who has strong social skills, knows the bosses, knows the subject matter experts in the company, as well as outside of the company, third parties that they can rely on to come in under contract to respond quickly to serious enough incidents that are beyond the cap capabilities of an organization, which uh, theoretically could happen to any organization. And then you have the t incident responders themselves, which there should be several, and they should be capable in their uh, skill set. They should be very well for informed. They should keep up with the technical developments in the field, and they should be technically skilled. You should be able to sit them down in an interview and have them do their job for things that are quick enough to do. <clears throat> Subject matter experts are sometimes third-party consultants because usually your budget does not allow you to keep the super talented people on a uh, incident response or security team uh, full-time. And so uh, you should have a list of consultants that you can rely on, that you can call upon. Uh, and then you should have someone on the incident response team that uh, I've heard referred to as Zeus or Thor or whoever. Someone who can get anything done. 
who has ultimate authority and can threaten to fire people if they do not comply with your request to resolve the incident. <clears throat> and so they can move, move the bureaucratic mountains and oceans, and they may be some form of executive uh, or stakeholder at a similar level. Uh, so executive might be the CISO or CTO, and they have the right to fire people in the general case. At the end of the day, the the keys to effective incident response all lie at clear leadership. You have to have a clear division of responsibilities and authorities. So these roles that I've just uh, described have to be very clear. Uh, there can be no confusion in the middle of a crisis as to who is doing what and who is looking into what. You need to have beforehand established plan and processes. You should know your entire network map and uh, you should know your systems inside and out and be able to respond to incidents in the general case uh, for any part of your network according to your plan. And if you don't have that much, if you're bringing in a third party team, that only increases the cost of, remedi of responding to the incident because now they have to learn the whole network. They have to figure out what goes where and how things work. <clears throat> Another key to pr effective incident response is keeping morale up. Uh, no one's going to have a perfect analysis of the the aftermath and everyone's always learning from mistakes in this field everyone good guys and bad guys <clears throat> and finally the final key to effective incident response is addressing the stakeholders expectations and keeping them in the loop and informed um, incident responders who ask good questions are uh, a key part of the team and finally any plan that you have should not be public for some reason people put these things on google docs or other places that are external and third party and this is an absolutely inappropriate place to store instant response plans uh, some tips for dealing with stakeholders effectively uh, is that they're going to be impatient at the end of the day no one likes hearing bad news and when they want it resolved quickly they're not going to understand the situation and the te technical uh, challenges that your incident response team may face, and they may not understand the technical details of the attack and the impact. They may not even understand the, po the policy and business impacts of the attack, uh, or let alone the impacts of the attack with regards to state and federal laws and regulations. If you are tasked with protecting certain types of information, such as medical information, that may have to be explained to some of the stakeholders. <clears throat> stakeholders at the end of the day may take efforts to micromanage your team and that can make things worse. And they can also slow things down and um, you're going to have in large enough organizations uh, teams that if your incident response takes long enough, you may be cutting into their business operations and their ability to turn profit and keep the bottom line. And so they may uh, slow things down by delaying cooperation with you. So that's why at the end of the day, having some Zeus level authority who can crack the whip and get things done promptly is going to be key to an uh, effective incident response team. There are some nuances of the incident response process that we have to go over first. Record keeping is key throughout start to finish of the process from logging the first indicators of compromise and logging what you've looked at how and where is going to be absolutely essential this information should not be stored on an external system it should not be stored in google docs or other public uh, resources attackers when they're targeting personally identifiable information uh, or similar stuff a lot of your incident response record keeping can reflect some of that information. So if you have trade secrets in the attack traffic that they're exfiltrating, keeping the records of that should not be outside of your, your network. And it should also be kept on a need to know basis because it possibly contains sensitive information that you haven't analyzed yet. It's going to be a period until you identify what was impacted and how that you're not going to know what the actual extent of the damage was to the system so you should treat it always as a worst case scenario in terms of uh, 
keeping the information private and protected. <clears throat> you also have to do a thorough job of recording any of the mistakes that the team made. And this is not <clears throat> not to use this against the team in any way or, or, or fashion. It's simply just to involve into the planning process so you can learn from any mistakes and have a, uh, a quicker response and more accurate response next time. And you should understand the attackers aren't telling you what they did. There's no chessboard in front of you. You don't see the moves that led you to this current disaster. The mistakes you're going to make are are going to be a natural process. The, in fact, in incident response, mistakes are very common in the response process. And it's going to keep you up all night. There's going to be a lot of 4 a.m. decisions where you're fueled by nothing but coffee, snacks, and everyone's exhausted. And at the end of the day, the reason all of this record keeping is key is because usually law enforcement gets involved and there's a chain of custody on evidence. And then you have to do it all with that in mind that some of this may have to stand up in the court of law in terms of forensic evidence if you ever manage to attribute the attack. Uh, say if it's credit cards and they find the culprit using credit cards and they arrest them, uh, that's going to have to stand up all in court. But in many cases, attribution is not possible with cybercrime. So this is a graphic from NIST on incident response and the life cycle of incident response. And stage zero, as many people say, is what's going on all the time should be preparation. It should, be, should have a plan. You should have these teams and resources and processes in place. You should have some meetings discussing like, okay, if X got hacked, you know, our, our most important database, if X got hacked, what, how do we respond, blah, blah, blah. And so once the impact happens, once there is an, a sufficient indicator of compromise that it seems like you have been breached, you then go into the incident response active mode, which is kind of a circular loop of detection and analysis. And then once you detect something, you go into containment, uh, eradication and recovery, or otherwise known as triage and remediation. And once you've identified that the incident is over, it's been remediated, you then have a post-incident uh, review and debriefing and evaluate what mistakes you made that could be fixed next time for the preparation phase and how you can streamline any of your process. So uh, these are old slides, but to reiterate, reiterate, stage zero is preparation. That's where you're establishing an incident response plan and team. Stage one is once an attack has been detected, detection and triage, and that's where localization of uh, payloads and malware throughout the system uh, occurs, and you identify the mortally wounded systems and focus and triage them off and focus on the ones that you can save that need to be saved and prioritize based off business impact. Stage two, containment. Once you've localized systems, uh, you want to localized threats on systems, you want to then characterize them. So this can be kind of a long-term process, but in the short term, you want to scramble to understand the problem and communicate, communicate quickly what is known. And the goal is to really get to the point where the incident is no longer a direct threat, where you can limit the scope of the incident to its current impact and stop the bleeding infection uh, and stop the spread throughout your network and business. Uh, it's important during this phase to communicate to the stakeholders any possible root causes. You don't have to have a definitive list. It can be a list of hypotheses. And uh, you want to watch out for follow-up attacks during these uh, remediation efforts. And uh, step three, remediation. It's easier said than done. Uh, again, uh, taking the systems offline is one of the first steps. And then characterizing what the problem is, what the threats are, is the next step. And then fixing it could be a very long process if there's a rootkit involved or uh, a similar impact. <clears throat> Finally, after the resolution of the incident, there should be an after action root cause analysis, uh, incident response report. And the aftermath is may 
aftermath may involve law enforcement, someone getting fired, or going to jail. So the average day-to-day -day for an incident responder is dealing with complaints and determining what is actually an incident. Some things are better suited for just IT tickets and forwarding along to technical support, but what is an indicator of something that requires a full-fledged incident response? There are often going to be false positives and false negatives in this process, and there's no perfect way of really determining since attackers never announce when they're coming. A common standard terminology is indicator of compromise, and that is a forensic artifact or a remnant of an intrusion that can be identified on the host or on the network. And this is a artifact that is used to communicate threat intelligence among defenders, both inside your organization as well as with uh, third-party entities like a CERT or uh, other form of authority. It's going to depend in nature by the attack and the attacker, uh, so it's going to drastically differ for insider threats versus outside hackers. Um, it's also going to depend on the attack vector. It's going to, if it comes over the network, you may have captured some aspect of it in the network PCAPs or the network logs. Hopefully, you keep them. But if it comes in over a malicious USB someone dropped off in the parking lot, it's going to take a long time to... Uh, to conclude that it actually was because of a USB. Here are some great examples. Ransomware hits you. It's very obvious. IDS alerts go off the, uh, like crazy. There's a lot of strange traffic on the network, especially egress traffic to new foreign destinations. Um, it, that should be especially concerning if their source IP is your intranet database servers. Uh, you have systems crashing all over the place. Um, another common example or situation is user machines are abnormally slow, which may not be an indicator of compromise. Um, it may be an indicator of the latest patch from who, whoever's your OS vendor, Microsoft, Apple, or whatever, uh, is really bad and it's causing everything to slow down. There are other straightforward indicators worth covering. Some uh, threat actor dumps your corporate emails or dumps your internal documents on Pastebin or WikiLeaks. Your corporate secrets are now on WikiLeaks or some audit reveals a massive amount of money or suspicious amount of money is unaccounted for. <clears throat> there are indirect ways to find out. You find out from the news. Maybe there's a whistleblower. It may not be legitimate though. It may be some imposter set to dissuade your customers or uh, ruin your reputation for security but it also may be a leak of uh, intellectual property which happens all the time uh, before big tech expos for say mobile vendors and uh, uh, tech companies it may be a leak of an upcoming merger and that has a lot of monetary value in terms of insider trading which is illegal and uh, maybe a leak of uh, a quarterly performance and other performance uh, reports. Now, indicators of compromise aren't just the initial indications that you may have an incident to deal with. They're all indicators throughout the entire incident response and investigation that point to potential compromise of an individual system or systems. So some other examples involve combinations of suspicious metadata on a host system, plus some complex malicious code, say a DLL or EXE that imports or exports a strange uh, amount of functions, or a strange list of functions, uh, creation of suspicious registry keys or mutexes on uh, Linux systems, uh, PAX logs, uh, a, any attempts that create seg faults, uh, which is something that uh, if you're doing instant response 
And if you have control over your organization's uh, network and you have Linux systems, absolutely put PAX on these things because PAX, uh, with one of the default settings, it will log any uh, seg faults and it will show you exactly what PC is pointing at. So you'll see, you'll be able to grep for PC space byte space at colon and it will show you what the raw bytes are. You can pipe that uh, in many cases directly to object dump or something in a, in a bash one-liner. And if it looks like a normal prologue, it's fine. But if it looks like shell code, then you can see like right there that, hey, this is a strong indicator of compromise. And so uh, we've covered a number of examples of indicators of compromise. And uh, at the end of the day, they boil down to either their weak indicator or their very strong indicator. And so there have been efforts uh, led by DHS and others to, uh, and MITRE notably, who you all should remember was uh, responsible for standardizing the CVE format that uh, hopefully you all are trying to get with your VLC fuzzing. <clears throat> Anyways, these organizations have been working to standardize indicators of compromise and their documentation and communication. And so the the incident object description exchange format is at openioc.org and there's an RFC on it and there are communication standards that if you get into this uh, profession you will encounter because uh, depending on your field US cert or if you're doing SCADA ICS cert they're going to be using sticks and taxi and cybox and so um, these are individual uh, standards that all play together. And uh, so TAXI stands for Trusted Automated Exchange of Indicator Information. That's a standard for establishing a trusted comms network for exchanging indicators of compromise inside your organization and also with third parties. Cybox stands for Cyber Observable Expression. STIX stands for Structured Threat Information Expression. And these both complement each other and can be used interchangeably in some situations. And so TAXI is a set of specifications for exchanging threat information with other organizations and in, inside your own organization. It does not go as far as establishing one monolithic or centralized information sharing program, and it doesn't come with any predefined default trust agreements that you may have to worry about. But towards that, it does require some setting up. So in setting it up, Taxi has three standard sharing models, hub and spoke, where there's one centralized clearinghouse, source and subscriber, or producer and subscriber, producer consumer, however you like to see it, where there's one organization as the source of the information and everyone else subscribes to their feeds and you can have n number of feeds. And then there's finally peer to peer where there's multiple informations consume each other's information and produce their own information. Now the GitHub project for Taxi, which is at the link at the top, taxiproject.github.io, um, there's also a, uh, a Python library that I think you can pip install on this lib taxi at the bottom. Anyways, inside the project currently there are four services and each service is optional and services can be combined in any number of ways. So there's an inbox service which is just designed to receive pushed content. Uh, that's what you subscribe to things with and subscribed information goes into your inbox. There's a poll, which is a service to request content, um, which pulls down content uh, from a producer, a hub, if you will. There's a, co a collection management service, which learns about and requests subscriptions to da data collections. So that's where advertisements for inf uh, hubs and sources can be uh, found in. And then there's the discovery service, which will learn services that and uh, learn how to interact with them. Uh, learn services that are already supported. Uh, right now, all of the information in Taxi is basically in XML format, and it's required to be communicated over HTTPS. 
The sidebox standard establishes a common structure for representing cyber observables, which are either going to be dynamic events or stateful properties. Some examples include packets, email messages, MD5 hashes for files or processes, URLs, domain names, or registry keys. This is designed for assisting with log management, malware characterization, indication sharing and incident response, and threat assessment. The link to the project is up at the top, cyboxproject.github.io. Styx is a language for standardizing the communication for representation of threat information. And to break it down, a single Styx structure covers the following objects. An observable is a dynamic event or stateful property that is represented in Cybox format. An indicator is an observable plus context. This context may include time range, information source, IDS flags or alerts, or etc. An incident is a set of adversary activity plus context. It may also include tactics, techniques, and procedures, and that should be self-explanatory by now. And the next object is the exploit target, which is formally defined as a weakness of a victim versus the tools, tactics, and procedures, but I would rather define it as the target of the observed exploitation at either a uh, level of fidelity that communicates both the, uh, the software service targeted as well as the operating system platform and at the best case is identifying the versions for all of these as well. The course of action object, or otherwise COA, is any suggested defensive actions against the threat, which involve both prevention, remediation, and mitigation. The campaign is a set of related TTPs, indicators, incidents, and exploit targets. The threat actor is uh, any title given for the current cyber adversary. To imagine how these all fit together, Styx is simply the language that you can use Cybox words in, and this is all communicated over Taxi. So Styx characterizes and provides a common structure for what is being said, and Taxi defines how Styx is shared. For more information, see the securityintelligence.com blog, which is uh, run by IBM. And uh, this specific blog post really cleared things up for me because there's, of course, going to be a lot of overlap. For an example, this, with the existing tools, uh, you can uh, visually represent some of the uh, observables in this fashion. And so we have threat actor and uh, information on them. You may have TP TTPs, you may have other observables, and so on. Uh, this is probably going to be more useful for your upper level management because they like to see visuals. So in the process of characterizing the, the attack and responding to it and containing it, uh, you probably want to consider some of the following actions. Fixing your firewall rules, uh, fixing especially probably the most effective action you can take on this list is fixing any of your egress rules if you're allowing all ports and protocols to communicate out of your network over uh, egress uh, that is a problem you should have that locked down uh, especially if the network traffic of that given network is very well defined and if you lock that down you might be able to shut off the command and control of the given campaign which is step number one in containing it. It can't be directed by a human actor to spread to other targets and to exfiltrate other uh, uh, assets. You should also fix any of your ingress rules uh, and tighten those up. You're going to want to address any network weaknesses. Uh, are any of your multi-home systems, say using LDAP 
or soap uh, showing up in such a manner that defeats your nats and your subnets. Um, you're going to want to see if you can uh, leak the IPs of, of multi-home systems from your subnets to see if you can reveal what the the the, the subnet IP for that multi-home system actually is behind its NAT. Next, you want to make sure the DNS can't be zone transferred and is locked down. Attackers, if they can see a DNS server, can be told to zone transfer, can tell it to zone transfer and say, hey, I am now the master. Give me all your DNS records for your intranet uh, network. And that is extremely useful in mapping a network for an attacker. Um, you also want to address any network awareness gaps and make sure that you have sufficient situational awareness throughout your organization network. You're going to want to add malware signatures, probably in Yara format, uh, which we'll show later in this video, to your IDS and uh, antivirus. And you're going to, throughout the whole process, try to identify the full extent of the compromise and what assets were targeted. And you're going to have to keep in mind that all your documentation is going to be used for impact investigation, law enforcement, reporting, customer, and investor notification, which I've marked in red because they made more, more serious for some, some cases. You're going to want to update your policies. You bring your own device, otherwise known as BYOD, as the bane of organizational and enterprise security because they can go home, do whatever they want on these devices. You have no control of it, and they bring it to your networks, and they connect them to the Wi-Fi, and any, any compromises they have on their systems are now being introduced behind your firewalls and within your networks. You also want to prohibit uh, social media, YouTube, and Pandora on any critical systems. Uh, all of these platforms are being increasingly used to deliver malware, not directly through uh, compromises of the systems, but through the advertisement ecosystems. Uh, actually, just today, we caught some uh, uh, malicious advertisements going over the Pandora website, and uh, Pandora has no way to be aware of these things. They're just trusting that their ad supplier is not distributing malicious content and uh, that's being increasingly uh, exploited by attackers this trust relationship you're going to want to patch systems and you're going to want to sit down and train personnel to stop cl clicking on phishing emails and fake AV pop-ups if that was the point of intrusion at the end of the day after a proper incident response you're going to have the damage contained identified and stopped uh, you're going to have documentation of the attacker, attack vector and TTPs, um, and hopefully the vector is patched or you're working with a vendor and it's in process of being secured, um, and you have some mitigation in place, and you have some TTP signatures to detect later attacks from the same campaign. You are going to have an incident response report. That's very important. It's going to it's going to explain in detail the impact of the breach and proof of your analysis. It's going to have details of the scope and damage done. Uh, it's going to have details of the start and end of the breach, uh, the time frame that you estimated it first began. Often, when attacks are initiated against organizations, it takes them on average six to eight months for them to even notice it. Uh, but it can go on for years. So this investigation is going to be important because if they've been there for a very long time, they may come back again. You, they may be utilizing other backdoors that they never activated in your current incident. You're going to have documentation on how you addressed the incident. And uh, you should have uh, some figures for what... Uh, funds from your incident response budget went towards this incident, what technical steps you chose. And uh, so the IR budget is going to cost the, the personnel, the overtime, contractors you brought in, any services, you, third party that you had to enlist. Um, the report is also going to have indicators of the compromise and how it was fixed, some narrative summary of how it was fixed and what steps you need to take in the future which may involve more penetration testing, which is proactive security, but it's only useful if you take the recommendations to heart and act on them, which too many organizations just get the pen test to check their compliance checkbox, but never do a damn thing with the report.
and at the end of the day, you need to revisit your understanding of your risks. If assets were popped and you're not really aware of the impact, you need to now revisit your risks. You need to think about, okay, what is really the potential impact for this asset getting owned? Is there something we're missing? Uh, is there something we missed when we architected this network? Do we need to revisit things and have better defense in depth? Too often, people just get the incident response report and get the pen testing report and be like, okay, that's great. Uh, just keep it, happen keep it from happening again, but then don't take any action to do it by giving this, uh, this need any budget or priority within the organization. And so if you've gotten to this point and your organization is looking at starting this whole process from scratch and you don't have a SOC, you don't have an incident response team, you don't have a C-cert, uh, there's some resources I can recommend. The next lecture is going to cover some of this. But there's also two good talks. One is building an incident response program and the link is provided here. Another one is 10 strategies of a world-class uh, cybersecurity incident response team. CERT.org, which is Computer Emergency Response Team, uh, run by MITRE, if I recall correctly. It's their, this is their guide, this link, to building a CERT team and plan. And uh, it's good standard advice. So now let's cover a somewhat comprehensive digital forensics and incident response toolkit that you're going to want to look at acquiring uh, for a incident response team. So here we go. The master tool rundown for digital forensics and incident response in general. For network traffic analysis, you absolutely should have Wireshark, TCP, TCP flow, and maybe consider getting TCP extract. Other good tools are network miner, I've seen used a lot. NetWitness, the free version is still good enough. Uh, Explico, uh, Ent, which is for file entropy and cryptanalysis, which can be used for looking at uh, attachments on the wire that you extract from packets and stuff like that. Bro also has really good stuff for file carving for traffic analysis. And the Network Appliance Forensic Toolkit is a open source Python a toolkit, it's pretty good. Um, you should never be running Wireshark as root. There are hundreds of vulnerabilities in Wireshark and all of its packet dissectors. Again, it is trying to parse all the things, and I've said that before in this class, and so it's naturally going to have many more vulnerabilities in your standard application. So, um, for intrusion detection systems, SNORT is pretty much an industry standard for uh, heuristic and signature-based intrusion detection. Suricata is a newer enter, uh, entry into the field, and Bro is a uh, industry-recognized uh, tool uh, that's reliable. For registry and file system analysis, there are a number of very expensive tools in this category, uh, but you can most cases get by with still free open source stuff. End case is the big gorilla in the room. It costs tens of thousands of dollars per CD key and uh, it does a number of things really well and is made uh, for Windows network uh, system admin and incident response and forensics work and uh, it has a comprehensive set of tools and features, uh, but many of these features can be accomplished by short little Python scripts. The neat, neat feature that NCASE does is allowing you to install endpoints on your organization systems and be able to do this all remotely. But again, SSH can facilitate that and uh, so yeah. The Sleuth Kit, which grew out of uh, TCT, is a open source free uh, kit for this work. Highly recommend it. Um, it's just got a wide array of features. I've used it myself for CTFs and I've got a lot of forensic flags with just the sleuth kit alone. 
Well, that and scalpel. Um, analyze MFT is for analyzing the main file table. If I recall correctly, that's what MFT stands for. And uh, this can be used for looking for hidden files or file system tampering to obfuscate when files were created, when they were modified, who they're owned by, and other properties, which malware commonly tries to do in an attempt to hide from detection and analysis. And uh, MFT tools also does this as well. Reg Ripper is for Windows systems, is for uh, extracting registry information and analyzing it. Uh, bulk Extractor, also good for mass file system analysis. And Mandiant's Redline tools, I think they have a free tile or they have a free version. Uh, either way, I've heard a lot of good things about them, but I haven't used them myself. For log analysis, Splunk has a wonderful free version of uh, their log analysis platform for, for situational awareness. It is just awesome. I use it myself. Log Viewer is also good. OSSEC has a pretty good host-based intrusion detection system. And uh, that works mostly off log, so I'd call that log analysis as well. For file system integrity, uh, pretty much there's there's been a lot of tools in this area, but they've fallen to the wayside in terms of being kept up to date. But the one that I see recommended the most is Sam Hain. Uh, for memory collect collection, which we'll show off uh, in a little bit, uh, there's FTK Imager, which is pretty much the most widely recommended uh, imager and you're going to need this tool for when you get to a system and you need a snapshot of it so you can analyze it later. Um, so this is a very very important tool in the evidence collection process and analysis process of incident response. Dump it is also widely recommended. Moon Souls is what I show off in a little bit. It's strictly for Windows. Let's uh, see, for remote administration toolkits like SSH, I'd, I'd consider in this and almost the whole Bash family of standard Linux tools. But uh, Racket, or Remote Acquisition and Triage Tool, um, is a framework for uh, collecting remote samples and images from systems. NCASE also does this, uh, but that's a commercial tool. I believe Racket is free. Uh, so that's worth checking out if you're on a, a budget. Now for process and memory analysis, uh, volatility is perhaps the big uh, tool in the room that most people use, and we'll show off a demo later. Um, it's not an interactive tool in most use cases, except when you're dumping uh, uh, images and using VolShell to look at them interactively. But uh, it's, a, it's more of an open source community framework that a lot of people uh, committed individual analysis tools to. Mandiant Redline is worth mentioning here. Windscope is a good one for Windows, um, but volatility will work on Windows, Linux, and I think other operating systems. For file carving, now here's where there's a lot of uh, uh, crossover into embedded systems, reverse engineering, hardware reverse engineering. Um, at least uh, for firmware and stuff like that. All those same tools are very useful here for, for this category because you face some of the same obfuscation challenges uh, in reverse engineering firmware. I digress. Scalpel, Binwalk, and Foremost are my go-to tools. Those three, they're all free, and I highly recommend them. I use Binwalk and Scalpel perhaps the most and Foremost when the other two fail. And this is primarily for extracting uh, hidden files or resources from a individual file. And uh, it's just a great set of tools. PhotoRec is also very good for dealing with anything hidden inside of image files or steganography. There's also PDF tools and PDF Stream Dumper, which are very useful for identifying hidden files inside a PDF, which uh, may be your uh, what your attackers are using and for debuggers it's going to depend on your operating system so here we have GDB immunity all debug win debug etc for malware analysis sandbox pretty much the most recommended I've seen is the free open source cuckoo uh, sandbox malwasm is one that's definitely 
it's a addition for it that's worth looking at um, and uh, it allows you to pause and rewind execution step by step uh, it requires a lot of resources to do this but it allows for just incredible dynamic analysis capabilities uh, for malware samples for reverse engineering there's ida pro there's the new binary ninja which is really great for x86 arm uh, and they're adding other architectures i believe um, but that is one that was uh, widely used in addition to ida and uh, the cyber grand challenge um, trail of bits put out a really great blog uh, using it for uh, cyber grand challenge and ctf and i think it was a thousand cuts with binary ninja but I digress. Um, Hopper and Ollie are also good reverse engineering platforms. Now for mobile, this is where there's less entries in the market, uh, but we can say that Oxygen Forensics, XRI, and Celebrite's UFED seem to be the most suggested uh, forensic toolkits for mobile systems, uh, but I have not had the opportunity to use any of them. Now for general toolkits, these are the catch-alls that do two or more of these above categories. There's Autopsy, there's Kane, there's FTK, there's OS Forensics, there's DFF, there's OCFA, there's the SANS SIFT Workstation, NCASE Forensics, X-Ways Forensics, and Coffee. And so uh, obtaining one or more of these will cover multiple categories, but you should at least try to have solutions for one of the above categories, if not more. I've tried to put together a pretty thorough list based off multiple uh, uh, advice blogs across the internet and uh, my own use and my own uh, circle of friends and asking them uh, what they use most often or what tools they found to be extremely useful in certain uh, incident responses. Volatility is a framework for extracting digital artifacts from RAM and memory dump samples. And uh, it's extremely useful uh, to have your systems on your network using virtual machines because you can just snapshot that stuff. You can even do it remotely. It's extremely convenient for uh, incident response and security operations. And uh, if you detect that it has been compromised, you can revert to a previous snapshot almost uh, instantaneously compared to other forms of manual remediation. Uh, that's the, the great thing about virtual machines is you can snapshot known good states and revert to them at a later date if you muck things up. So volatility works for both 32-bit and 64-bit versions of Windows XP, 2003, Vista, 7, 8, and 10. Uh, it also has support for uh, some uh, Linux system, if I recall correctly. And it has two interfaces. There's a single command uh, line uh, interface where you can only run a single command. And then there's the interactive vol shell, which allows you to run m multiple commands in one instance. Uh, so you can do multiple passes of analysis. And uh, it's extremely useful. But the problem with volatility is you're scanning entire systems memory dump, not just one process in many cases. And so that, for a single analysis pass, is going to take quite some time. So I highly recommend that your insert response team that is using volatility has really beefy systems that can handle loading uh, 8, 12, 16 gig files into memory or, you know, uh, dealing with those. It's not going to load the whole thing into memory. It's going to uh, load it into pages as on demand. But, uh, yeah that will really speed things up. So to get a memory dump for volatility, if you don't have a virtual machine, uh, one tool that I have used in the past is Moonsoul's memory dump. And uh, you can get that at moonsouls.com. And so a memory dump is a binary file. It's not gonna have any standard file format. It may just be .bin if you're lucky. Uh, that contains the complete contents of system memory. So you're gonna have the stack, the heap, you have all the memory segments, and uh, that's going to be for the entire system across all operating, all processes, including the kernel and uh, daemons and services. 
An example screenshot for uh, Moon Souls uh, is we use Win32DD, which is uh, basically DD for Windows. Uh, and uh, these are the typical outputs that you would see of it. It would give you the OS version, the physical memory, give you some uh, uh, indicator of how much memory is actually in use. It, prob it, it won't. Uh, say if you have 60 gigs of RAM, it's not going to write a file that's 60 gigs of RAM if uh, it's not being 100% utilized. <clears throat> and uh, it, it gives you all this diagnostics and then asks you yes or no whether or not you'd like to continue with the dump. And uh, it'll take some time and then it'll tell you when it's done and it'll timestamp it for you, which is really nice. So let's take a quick look now that you understand like the process to get a memory dump which is very simple um, what type of commands you can run with volatility so volatility is currently at 2.5 but they still uh, recommend everyone uses the 2.4 edition documentation of their cheat sheet so, so the cheat sheet has a number of resources on the left and it goes over basic usage, and then it has three pages or more, yeah, there's five pages now of commands that span various categories, and they now have Mac OS X support as well. So, um, perhaps the most useful ones to start off would be uh, the network ones to see what network information, so con scan, will scan the process dump for any active connections that are currently in memory at the time of the dump, um, as well as SOC scan, because the uh, malware may have uh, rootkitted the system and may be manipulating the one table that ConScan uh, analyzes. Uh, there's also NetScan, um, and uh, you can look up also the browser history so they have support for our internet explorer i think there's modules for firefox and chrome if i recall correctly there should be you can look up command scan and console history uh, you can look up event logs um, there's specific ones to look for injected code and malfind is something that looks for um, injected code blocks like DLL injection and stuff like that. And once you've identified something that has injected code in it, you can then do a uh, DLL list to see what it has imported. Um, and you can see imp scan to see what is what artifacts of uh, module imports are in the given process uh, memory dump. See registry. You can do hive list. Uh, also, you want to look for any form of hooking. API hooks is really good. That's going to catch many forms of key loggers. Um, you can dump the screen, uh, the desktop, which is pretty awesome. Um, And uh, there are going to be some malware specific scans that uh, are going to just target specific malware campaigns, so like Zeus, Citadel, Poison Ivy, and uh, Java, Java Rat. Um, so Zeus scan, Citadel scan, etc. Those are useful for that. You can uh, basically look at the structure for those because this is all open source to see if it's uh, something that you can make into a skeleton and build an individual scanner for any campaign that you're looking at. Uh, otherwise, you can use Yara rules um, to do generic scans with volatility for a given process memory dump or system memory dump. And uh, that's how you can uh, build identifiers and then share them so you don't have to share uh, you know, some script that you've written for volatility. Instead, you can share the Yara rules, which can be used by Bro or something else. 
The cheat sheet has a number of general suggestions of uh, activities and the commands and options that we would use to accomplish them. So you can check if a domain, if a process has domain or enterprise admin level status, and it would be get SIDs, and then you grep for whether it's domain or enterprise. And uh, this is worth going down and uh, trying and seeing what your results are. And so you can see that it has uh, Linux support and it can dump process information. Uh, so it can do a process map. You can list the open file descriptors, which is great because sometimes you can hide uh, the sockets and connections, but it'll show up still as open file descriptors in some cases, depending on how they've uh, done it. Let's see, there's other ones that I haven't covered yet that I know I've used. Let's see. Yeah, it's under process listing. So PS list is probably one of the first things you want to do. You also want to do PS scan to see if there's any hidden or terminated processes that are still hanging around in memory. PS tree is really useful. It'll show you uh, a tree of all the processes running, the, the parent and child processes for each, and a nice ASCII tree format. And so you can see what spawned what. So you, if you see something uh, service basis spawn some other uh, process that doesn't make sense in that context, that might be an indicator that uh, it has been compromised. Uh, so that's worth keeping in mind. Anyways, let's get back to the lecture. So using volatility and a memory dump, you can analyze the process list, the thread list, all, each process is memory, all of the active connections, all of the sockets, all of the DLLs, all of the malware backdoors that are currently in memory, which may leave zero forensic evidence on disk, which is why uh, um, dynamic me well, memory analysis is very useful. And uh, in, in general, if you're getting started with volatility, dash H is for help and dash V is for verbose output. There are some nuances that are worth covering. Volatility will silently fail if you give it bad options. And this is a common problem through most of its community plugins. And you have to keep in mind that most of the options are community written plugins, so they fail in weird ways. They're not always going to work. They don't work for all versions of Windows. And in the general case, they just fail for IPv6 networks. And so that means scanning for connections that are IPv6 and sockets are going to be problematic with the existing tools. So uh, process memory dumps and scanning them for uh, malware backdoors will often trigger your antivirus system, which I've seen in practice that if you use volatility to scan this and it's looking at this and your AV is going and it's looking at it at the same time, it's like, well, holy crap. This, is, uh, this needs to be quarantined, and that can uh, really be a pain. So the rest of this video is going to be uh, original video from a uh, demo of Volatility, Ida Pro, and Yara looking at a systems dumped memory that has been compromised and identifying the compromised process, isolating its memory dump, looking at that individually, then looking at it with IDA, identifying some signatures for it, and then building Yara rules for it. I hope you enjoy. So at home, this is a scenario that I basically ran uh, through a vector I'm not going to tell yet. Uh, I exploited a victim, a Windows XP machine, and spawned a perturbator payload. I ran get system, then I spawned calculator.exe. Then I migrated to calculator.exe. I could have migrated to explorer.exe to be more subtle, but this is just for the sake of demonstration. Then it basically, a little bit after that point, I took a snapshot of the memory, and then this is where we're proceeding. So <clears throat> given the snapshot, an easy, quick way to get started is to start off just with Malfine. If Malfine turns up results, it will dump the, uh, if you tell it to, it will dump all the process images for any of the suspicious results, and you can then analyze them there. Um, 
it won't name each process. Like this is calc.exd. It will say this is basically, it won't even say this is PID this. Um, when you run uh, PS list, it will tell you the PID, the address it's running at, and the size of the image. When it when Malfine and ProcMap dump and these things dump these images, they address them by the address they start at and the size. And you have to basically go back to the process list and match this up. So Malfine finds things based off VAD tag and page permissions, and it can't detect DLLs injected into a process using create remote thread, you know, load this DLL. Um, it's still very helpful, but like I said, it's not a silver bullet. So other things I've mentioned are IDR modules, DLL list, and MScan. So Malfind is actually uh, commonly used by incident responders. And here's an example of it using to find uh, Zeus-related malware. And Zeus is basically a crime kit that you can buy for I don't know how much money on the bike, on the underground, but it is pretty common. Um, <clears throat> so you can specify for, mal for Malfine exactly what process to look at. And it'll tell you the relevant, basically, modules. So here, um, Zeus happened to infect, basically, by injecting a DLL into explorer.exe. Um, so what I've prepared, basically, to demonstrate is how you would use volatility and these tools that we've shown so far through the class, how to do triage and containment, how to do response, basically, resolution. <coughs> So hopefully I can do this in 20 minutes. Um, if the first thing you do is malfind, it may take a couple minutes, and it will dump basically on the console uh, all the relevant information. So to tell it to dump to basically a file, you give it hyphen capital D, and you tell it what directory to do. And so it dumps all the process images here. So some are just raw binary data. And if you try to open them up in like IDA, it's going to have no PE headers. It's just going to be raw binary data. And you may face like alignment issues with decoding the opcodes right. So you need to find basically the process entry point and be able to start from there. And that's a pain. However, many times it will actually dump a valid PE with PE headers. Some of, this, some of the tables may be stripped, like the IAT tables. Um, so... <clears throat> Going through those and opening them up one by one, you can quickly, with something like IDA, figure out, okay, what's suspicious, what's not. Um, and from also the console output, you can generally correspond what process is what. Um, so at the end of iterating through this, I found something actually really, really interesting, and it happened to be in calc.exe. I found these strings called priv underscore password underscore get sam hashes and priv elevate get system. Why would calculator or any program actually need those two strings? So I did some more investigation. They're stored in the R data, so not stored actually in the dot text or anything like that. Um, so and we have all these other strings stored in the R data. <clears throat> and at the uh, almost right away, that should tell you something's going on. There's this is either a malicious version of calc.exe or it's a compromised version of calc.exe. And since I happen to be familiar with Meterpreter, I know this command called get system, and so that's a pretty dead giveaway. Um, so this is a strong indicator of compromise. This is not something that should normally be in calculator.exe, even if I were to be uh, mean and put this in explorer.exe for the sake of example, why would explorer.exe need get system or get SAM hashes? Um, even get SAM hashes seems totally relevant. Maybe in some weird implementation of explorer.exe, it needs system access to do something. Um, but that's why the, the NTDLL and Win32 API exists. So that to handle sensitive kernel-level functions, you pass it through this user 
land API that passes along to the Win32 API that runs at system level, at kernel level. So to bypass that seems completely against the entire design principles of Microsoft's operating system. So that in itself, if you, if you happen to understand that, it's one of the first things that I taught, you would probably, you probably recognize, hey, this is, this is wrong. This shouldn't exist. Um, and it just so happens that there's no actually API call to call this. So what this turns out to be, um, is uh, so since we studied Meterpreter, the first thing Meterpreter does is it loads basically once the established core starts injecting DLLs in the client side to establish uh, the functionality. It does everything through reflective DLL injection. And so the first DLL it loads is a standard API. And in that standard API are commands like get system and get same hashes. So even the, and it loads that standard API 100% of the time. Uh, it may not load anything else, but that itself is a, is a sufficient uh, indicator that, hey, uh, something's going wrong. This is actually probably an interpreter session. Um, so this is not just malware. So uh, I discussed this with some of my friends, and um, well, let's get to the slide. Given these two strings, you can write a signature to detect this running in memory. However, you have to have the ability to basically scan the entire process image, uh, which is time intensive. But AVs do do this, and host-based intrusion detection systems do this, and perhaps a custom rat. Does everyone know what a rat is? I haven't talked about it. No one, good, okay. It stands for a remote administration tool. It's just co something common with system administration. I'm not gonna really test on it. Um, so. Rats are basically something used by system administrators to poke around in the system that they've just customly written. Um, or perhaps it's an open source one. Uh, so to demonstrate that you can write a signature for this, there's a, a, a rule language called Yara, and it's based off J, generally C structs. And so I have an example Yara rule below that will detect interpreter in memory. You could use this on a, a host-based intrusion detection system, and it will detect any active interpreter sessions as long as it manages to scan it. So let's talk about interpreter. Say you have an exploit. You send it over the wire. You send it on an open port. The firewall lets it through. You have, your pay, you have the packet's payload. Basically, the application data you're sending is encoded to get past the firewall, the intrusion detection system, to get past the web application firewall. Everyone with me? So at the point where it actually uh, hits the vulnerable system and starts executing, perhaps it starts decoding itself to get uh, around the problems of bad bytes and null bytes. And then after the end of that, you probably perhaps have raw opcodes right there. Even if you have further encoding at that point, uh, like Shikata guy, guy Nai, or something else being active, uh, if that function gets run and it decodes itself, at that state it will be decoded in memory. Um, so if you have these strings like this uh, somewhere in that payload, uh, it will be visible at that time. I'm going to talk at the end of that how you would improve interpreter to basically make this more or less undetectable. So you could write you could use this uh, rule to detect interpreter sessions um, just based off the printable strings in the process image. Um, there's other ways you could do it. You could find specific opcode series uh, to interpreter. Uh, say some of the some of the opcodes and one of the main functions in the standard DL, standard API DL, or in the core system itself, and use those to build basically detection rules so that you can act on interpreter events or interpreter-related intrusions. So before deploying any uh, new rule to antivirus or intrusion detection system, it's essential that you do some testing first. Because these things are heuristics, and statistically, they can encounter false positives and false negatives. 
Um, so you want to make sure that, hey, this actually detects this. Uh, you could do it through volatility itself. It supports something called Yara scan. So it will scan the memory image you've given it, which is exactly the same as any EV scanning the full memory of a given system for it, um, for anything that matches these Yara rules. And you can see it's basically A equals priv escalate get system, B equals priv get same hashes, and the condition is that A and B are both present. It's really straightforward. And so if that rule is matched, Yara scan will return true. This matches. And so that's a good test. And also return any details. This is the PID it matches. Now, if it happens to match something else, say, instead of naming these things, priv escalate get system, priv password get same hashes, they named it something clever. And they still wanted to keep, you know, printable strings. They just wanted to get around this whole problem by naming it something that's common somewhere else. You can see how false positives would come back. Like if they made A B user name and B B password, and that's just their functions to own shit, um, you can see how this would generate false positives, which is why you would perhaps need to go to another route for writing signatures, um, specifically going for matching hexadecimal bytes, um, looking for the specific opcodes. So if all is good, perhaps you establish a whitelist and say smss.exe actually has this also. And so your condition with this be adapted that A and B are present and it's also not smss.exe. And it would be that simple. Um, so then you would update basically the host and intrusion protection systems across the network with this or the AV if they're compatible with this rule and uh, then have it uh, act with uh, the, have it specified to act with kill any matching process that matches this rule. And then all interpreter sessions in the network will hopefully be killed. And it's really that simple sometimes. Um, obviously, uh, it depends on whether or not your systems support uh, Yara rules. Um, so, uh, also a side note. So we saw, we see priv escalate get system um, and priv escalate get same hashes. These actually don't by themselves indicate the user, the attacker has attempted to get system or to steal the same hashes. Um, so you have to do further analysis to actually determine that. Um, so analysis would be like looking at the handles for open files to see anything related to the same hashes like uh, looking at see if LSAS, perhaps the, the process uh, has an open handle that something is actually scanning through the process memory for LSAS.exe, or something is actually uh, has system access and has open SAM, uh, the SAM file itself. There's an open file handle there. And so there's a plugin in volatility that I think I skipped over called handles. And it's just like uh, LSOF with Linux, and that's basically ls for all the open file descriptors. So discovering those would obviously require more investigation. Um, so like I said, altern alternate rules for uh, Yara or other signatures uh, usually involve the capability to search for hexadecimal strings along with wildcards, and wildcards could just be a question mark, and they would just be filled in by anything. Um, it's pretty simple, regular expression matching. So there are some things that use Yara. I use it because it's easy to understand and thus it's easy to teach. Um, so these vendors use it. Volatility also uses it uh, thanks to a community plugin. Uh, whoever wrote that is awesome. And uh, FireEye and ClamAV, uh, these vendors slash products, are the only ones that I know of that happen to be host-based intrusion detection systems and antivirus. The MAV is Linux only, as far as I know. And FireEye, you have to pay for it. Um, and they support UR rules. Now, if you had a different intrusion detection system that you could write rules for, obviously you'd have to write it in whichever language is supported. I simply use Yara because it's easy. So <clears throat> we've detected that calc.exe currently hosting a interpreter session, and we're able to find, just by looking at the strings, which is a lucky find in itself, 
that there's some suspicious activity going on. Even if we didn't know as an interpreter and didn't have this inside knowledge, we could recognize, if we're careful, that why does calculator have get system and get same hashes? Um, so you could build a YAR rule just off that knowledge, and then you use YAR as scan to automate detection of whatever memory dumps you had across the network. Uh, perhaps you're just doing one thing at a time. Once you establish a rule, you can use that rule on all the other memory dumps you have to speed up analysis. Find out what other processes across machines the attacker is potentially compromised at that time. And that is a wonderful way to help you identify the scope of the attack. So, in responding to it, we want to identify where the attacker is coming from and identify whether the attacker compromised the system token. If he did, there's a higher chance of him having the ability to establish a rootkit. And that is a pain. <coughs> So, using Volatility's uh, plugin API hooks, it looks through any processes and finds instances where the API uh, has, uh, tables have been hooked. In other words, they've been modified to point to perhaps uh, attacker code that does some stuff and then jumps somewhere else, perhaps back to the original function. Um, and so, the results tell us that SVC hosts has some API hooks in it, that foxitreader.exe has API hooks in it, and Windows Update, basically Windows Auto Update Control has uh, exe hooks in it. So breaking these down, svchost.exe is something that you'll often find dozens of things running, and dozens, dozen versions of it running at the same time. Um, is also running with system privilege. So if something running a system has API hooks present in it, something had access to edit it. Usually that means something already had uh, a system token access or exploited some vulnerability in SVC host or some unknown vulnerability to obtain that privilege. So <clears throat> that's a strong indicator of compromise for compromise of the system token. Also, the presence of API hooks in Foxit Reader indicate that that perhaps was the initial vector. So this could all possibly be some malicious PDF hitting your network. Um, and Windows, uh, uh, Windows Update Auto Control is a user level process. It may have also been affected. I don't know. So, uh, using ConScan, which on my system took 25 minutes to run. Yeah, this is why I'm not going to do this for you in class. Um, I don't want to put you all asleep. Um, it shows four connections are currently open, but there's only two IP addresses really being used. One is the gateway, and one is 192.168.1.161. I didn't have time to make it some uh, foreign IP address to make this all you know, more realistic. But also, I should note that when dealing with this at a realistic level, you should expect to see this being a really populated table. And, but at least it shows you uh, IP addresses to start with. And you can start doing who is requests and see uh, what's the legitimate service, perhaps 74.whatever.whatever, whatever, whatever, whatever. This is Google, um, and so on and so on. And you can identify perhaps Tor exit nodes or proxies. Um, or anonymous VPN services that are being used. Um, then with that information, you can update the firewall to, if you really want to, to perhaps just drop all connections uh, being uh, initiated to or from that IP address. <clears throat> so since we're basically out of time, um, I demonstrated how we use volatility and Ida to find basically the back door, just with malfind. We got a little bit lucky. Um, I didn't show you uh, going through all the process stuffs with Ida. Um, showed you the compromise process. Uh, we found the attacker's IP, and we have a strong indicator the attack vector was a Foxit reader exploit. 
and also uh, indicator that the system token was compromised from the API hooks. And this was all without using any disk forensic evidence. Um, so I could, someone could realistically have an entire semester long course on this stuff. So, however, hopefully given all the information on offensive stuff I've presented to you thus far through the semester, you kind of have an ability to pick this up pretty easily and at least be able to follow along with what I'm saying. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, I kind of already talked about Vol Show. Any questions? Yes. If there's a group hit on the system, will that be, will there be evidence of that on the disk? Uh, probably yes. Um, unless it's a uh, ring negative one or ring negative two root kit, um, in which case it could infect things like the certain parts of the BIOS. There's been root kit proof of concepts that write themselves to uh, MacBook batteries. Uh, Charlie Miller, I believe, reverse engineered the whole API with which basically the MacBook figures out how much charge is left on the battery, tells it what time it is, and makes the clock run, and keeps the clock synchronized. And there's basically this, this I.O. communication going on with the battery, and there's a, some buffer overflows on the battery's firmware, and you basically use that to write his rootkit to the battery, and you have to buy a new battery, and that's the most expensive part of the MacBook. So, um, no, rootkits could be beyond the disk. Good question. Any other questions? <coughs>